Well, good morning to you. God bless you. It's so good to be here with you this morning. I think the last time we were all with you all, we were at the, um, at the school, I believe. So it's good to, good to be back here with you all. As I sought the Lord over the past several days about what to share with you here this morning, uh, the message that came to mind that I would like to share uh, it kind of goes with a song that I wrote a number of years ago. And uh, we, we put it on an album, I think, two years ago. And uh, so I want to I wanna share that here with you this morning. Um, I do miss my family here this morning. They're at, uh, they're at Town Line, uh, where we call our home church. And um, when we're in the area, it's hard to get them to go anywhere else except for Town Line. And we like that they like our home church. And so that is, that is a blessing. Uh, but I do miss them where they're up here. And I don't do a lot of singing by myself anymore. They're with me and playing different instruments and singing. And especially on this song, Logan plays the uh, ukulele on this one. But um, anyway, this one is uh, simply called Blessings. Sitting out under the clear blue sky, counting my blessings and wondering why God keeps pouring his favor on my life. Then a small voice says to my heart, listen up, son, and remember this part. I am a God who loves to bless his people. Enjoy your blessings, but don't forget the blesser. And remember that sometimes a whole lot more is lesser. Count your blessings and thank the blesser. Share them with someone who has a lot lesser. Cause you've been blessed so you could be a blessing today. A hey, a hey, you could be a blessing today. Sitting out under the clear blue sky, counting my blessings and now I know why. God keeps pouring his favor on my life. Then I take a look right around me, maybe a friend or a neighbor in need. I serve a God who loves to bless his people. Enjoy your blessings, but don't forget the blesser. And remember that sometimes a whole lot more is lesser. Count your blessings and thank the blesser. Share them with someone who has a lot lesser. Cause you've been blessed so you could be a blessing today. A hey, a hey. You could be a blessing today. Every morning is a privilege I can open up my eyes. I swing my feet out on the floor and stretch my hands to the sky. Enjoy your blessing, but don't forget the blesser. And remember that sometimes a whole lot more is lesser. Count your blessings and thank the blesser. Share them with someone who has a lot lesser. Cause you've been blessed so you could be a blessing today. A hey, a hey, you could be a blessing today. A hey, a hey, you could be a blessing today. All right, you can turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2, if you would. Exodus chapter 2. The message I want to share with you this morning comes out of a series that we share. Is it okay if I push this mic to the side? Okay. Uh, the message I'm sharing this, uh, uh, here this morning is one that comes out of a series that we share uh, on the spiritual gifts. And uh, the title of the message this morning is, What is in Your Hand?, what is in your hand? And uh, somebody once said that life is what happens while you're waiting for life to happen. And uh, an example of that is, is you sit around waiting for God to do something big, and while you're doing that, the days and the weeks and the months and the years go by, and next thing you know, uh, a long time has gone by, and you're still waiting on God to do something big in your life. So life is what happens while you're waiting for life to happen. And so the question this morning is, what is in your hand? And I think one of the things that spurred this thought for me years ago 
was as I travel and as we travel as a family, I get messages and I get people talking to me a lot and they say, Amos, one of these days I want to be used by God just like you are. And especially around the whole idea of singing, you know, as, uh, as a family. And uh, one of the things I've started doing is I say, well, what are you doing now? And the answer that normally comes back normally has the word just in front of it. I am just a farmer. I am just a truck driver. I am just a contractor. I, here's, here's, here's my favorite. I'm just a mom. I love that one. What is in your hand? What do you have in your hand? Um, one of the things that gets us there is we separate work from ministry. We separate our Monday through Saturday life from our Sunday life. And so here in this passage of scripture, by the way, if you haven't read your Bible this week, we're going to catch up today, okay? We're going to read so much scripture today. And what I'd like to do is go through it kind of in sections And then, so I will read a couple sections, and I'll back up and make a couple comments on that section. So, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 2. It's the story of um, Moses, the story of Moses here. And so, if you're there, Exodus chapter 2, I'm sorry, did I say verse 1? I did not mean that. I meant verse 11, if if I already said a verse. Not sure if I did. I was a bit sidetracked there. So one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and he looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that. And seeing no one, he struck down the the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he had gone out the next day, behold, two uh, two Hebrews were, uh, they were there struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, Why do you strike your companion? He answered, Who made you prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid, and he thought, Surely the thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. So let me just back up and make a couple comments there. First of all, I want to say to all of us, especially the young people and the children, and I tell my children this all the time, and I even remind myself this, it says that Moses looked this way and that, and then he did what he was going to do. Here's a news alert. Anytime you're getting ready to do something and you look this way and that, guess what? You're not supposed to do it. That should be a red light that flashes in our brain that says, if you're looking around to check that nobody is watching, here's your sign. Don't do it. Amen. That's for young people. That's for adults. That's for older people, whatever. That is true all around. He looked this way and that way. Seeing no one, he struck him. And, and, and then in, uh, in verse, um, let me see, verse 14, he was afraid and he ran. He was very discouraged. Okay? I want to read the next section in uh, beginning verse 16. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters. And they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up to save them and watered their flock. Now, I want to point something out here. When I ask what is in your hand, one of the things I'm asking you is what is your natural gift? What do you do without even thinking about it that you're doing? And the reason I ask that is, I, uh, where is that? Is it Matthew 27, you know, where it gives the picture of the judgment and Uh, You know, Jesus looks at those on his left and he looks at those on his right. And he says to both groups, to the ones on the left, he said, I was here and you did not. And they asked the same question that the ones on the right ask. Because on the ones on the right, he said, I was in prison, I was thirsty, I was naked, I was this, I was lonely, and you did this. Both of them had the same question. When did we not do that or when did we do that? You get that? When did we? They weren't even aware. I say some of the greatest works we do in our life is that which we don't even know we're doing. We're doing it because it is the nature that God has put in us, and we're living out of the natural ability of the Holy Spirit in us. Because whenever we are operating out of the natural thing that God has given us, we are blessing others, and we don't even know it. 
You notice that whenever Jesus said, I was in prison, I was hungry, I was thirsty, they didn't say, oh God, it was by your grace. It was just by your grace. No, they didn't say it. They said, when did we do that? They were just going about their day, honoring God with their life. And in the meantime, they were blessing people and God was being glorified. Amen. Amen. I want to point out here that Moses had an anointing on his life right from the beginning Watch it, two words, to save and deliver, to save and deliver, to save and deliver. Watch for that. He saw two people fighting. What did he do? The very first thing he wanted to do is he wanted to what? Can you say it? Save and deliver? Save and deliver. That's what he wanted to do. It was in him. He went out. He is discouraged. He's lost. He is upset. And he sees seven, um, uh, he sees seven women who are trying to water their flock. In come the shepherds, and they bullied the women, and they drove, their, you know, they drove the flock away. Moses, out of his nature, stepped up to do two things. What were they? Save and deliver. Moses' nature. He's doing what God has put. Let me back up here a little bit, and I want to talk a little bit about I'm normally sharing this in the context of already having to set up the whole thing of the, you know, of the spiritual gifts. I want to back up a little bit if you would allow me to do that. Hopefully we won't lose our train of thought here. But a spiritual gift, what is a spiritual gift? Well, I'm a pretty simple thinking guy, so I like to think in very simple terms. The word spiritual gift, if you hadn't noticed, is, or the term is made up of two words. Spiritual gift, right? So the word spirit, the Greek word is pneuma. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? One person knew that. So it's made up of the word pneuma. How many of you know what the word pneuma means? Anybody? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I'm not a, I like Greek words, but I don't know how to pronounce most of them. Anybody know what the word pneuma means? Breath. There is a, there's, that is correct, most of us came here this morning with the help of pneuma. We rode here on vehicles that have pneumatic tires. The word pneuma is the root word for the word pneumatic, and it means air, breath. Jesus spoke to them and breathed on them the Holy Ghost. It's breath. It is pneuma. It is a movement. It is a gust of wind. You know, the Spirit blows where it will. Remember that part? It is pneuma. It is breath. And some people say, oh, I don't know, I get kind of scared and you start talking about this whole spirit stuff. You know, this, you know. Here's the thing I learned many, many years ago as I was praying through some of this stuff. I said, Lord, help me to know what, you know what is moving me and what is you that's moving me and what is my own flesh and what is you know, Satan and what is that. And the Lord spoke to me. I was praying in a cornfield, believe it or not, on my face in a cornfield down by Rochester, Indiana. I'd been driving truck, and I took my lunch break, and I made my way out to it. I was like, Lord, please, I want to understand this. And God spoke to me in a very simple way that he always does to me. And he said, Amos, here's the thing. Anytime that my spirit is moving you, it will always, always, always move you toward me, toward holiness, toward righteousness. Amen. Any movement that moves you away from Christ or to something that is not holy, guess what? It is a spirit, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. So when something is moving you, ask the question, what is it moving me toward? Is it moving me into more likeness of, uh, you know, of Jesus? Or is it glorifying me or someone else around me? Is it glorifying a system or is it moving me toward Jesus? Okay, so that's the word spirit. The word gift means quality or endowment or charisma. Think about that. Quality or endowment. Have you ever seen somebody and you just think, man, that dude's just got a gift. I mean, he's just got a gift. Like, and it doesn't even have to be preaching or singing. It can be anything. Like, man, he or she, like, they're, like, they're just really good at that. That's an endowment. That's a gift. That's a quality. Charisma. We know that word. It comes from the Greek word charis, which is the same Greek word that the English word, uh, word grace comes from. So with that endowment, with that gift, comes grace and charisma. So it is your pneumatic charisma. How about that? It's your pneumatic charisma. So back to Moses. So he has two things that is in him, and that is to save and deliver. 
And so, you know, the girls go back to their home, verse 18. When they came home, they told their father, and he says, how is it you've come home so soon today? And they said, an Egyptian delivered us. See that? Out of the hand of the shepherds and even drew the water for us and watered the flock. What a gentleman. Verse 20, he said to his daughter, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man. And he gave Moses his daughter uh, Zephora, and they gave birth to a son and called him Gershom. And he said, I have been a sojourner in all the foreign land. Okay? So Moses, we know that he's got a burden, and it's to save and deliver. Okay? Let's jump to the next section, which is verse 23. During those days, many... I'm sorry, let me start over. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. I'd like to stop right there for just a minute. When I read this, I don't know what happens in you, but when I read this, my heart is overwhelmed with the love of God. Let me tell you something. I've reminded myself over and over God knows and God sees. God knows and God sees. Their cries came up to God. Their cries for rescue came up to God. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant. And when when God saw the people of Israel, he knew. God knew. Now, chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There again, my heart is just overwhelmed with the love of God. I'm amazed. You You know, so it's like God knows where Moses is. He knows what he's doing. He said he took his flock. He didn't go to Midian. He went to the west side of Midian. God knows. God knows. Are you on the east side of Goshen or or west side of Goshen? Are you south or north of Goshen? I have no idea, but God knows. God knows where you're at. He knows where you're at. He's hearing your cries, if there are cries. He knows. God knows. Can the church say amen? Amen. This is good stuff. I am. it, 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 It just blesses me to know that we have that kind of father. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire and out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burning. When the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him out of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt because of their cry and because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Let me ask you a question. God sees the suffering and it burdens God. But who else has a burden for his people? Who else? Moses. Exactly. Moses has a burden for his people. It's been there ever since he was a young boy. When he came out and he saw two people fighting, immediately save and deliver. And he has a burden built in him for his people. Do you have a burden? Do you have a burden that is on your heart? Have you carried it for years? Moses was in the school of wilderness for 40 years, by the way, letting that burden, you know, mature and, and, and build and break him. He's out doing his job. He's doing what is in his hand, and he's working. And God shows up, and God connects with the burden that is in Moses' heart. Who put the burden there, by the way? God put it there. God put the burden there. He says, I have come down here to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. God is touching on the nerve that Moses lives by. He's a, he wants to save and he wants to deliver. 
and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Excuse me. And the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel have come up to me, and I, I have also seen the... I have seen the oppression with which the uh, which with with which the Egyptians oppress them. Verse ten is the invitation to the burden that Moses has. Almighty God says, "Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that he may bring or that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt." There was the invitation. You see, the difference is oftentimes when we get born again and when God fills us with his spirit and we start going out and we start living, I don't know if you were like I was, but 20 years ago when I got saved and I started understanding things of spiritual gifts, I recognized the gifts. There were things that started coming up. I went through a class. I wanted to understand this stuff. And I saw it come up and I'm like, that's my gift. And you know what? It was and it still is to this day. But one important ingredient that I missed I had not yet matured in that. God had not yet called me to it. I can identify with Moses so much. I came out of the wilderness. I mean, I came out of my, you know, youth of being a Christian, and I thought it was immediately time to step into the gift, but it wasn't. I needed to walk in it. I needed to grow. I needed to mature. Moses did the same thing. He came out. He saw a problem. Boom, save and deliver, and he killed somebody because he didn't understand the whole heart of God and what God wanted to do. It takes something special to have a burden, to see a problem and not try to solve it immediately. It takes a special kind of maturity to go to the closet and say, oh God, that what I saw today, Lord, it breaks my heart. God, what would you have me to do with that? Amen. Where we don't immediately try to fix it, but we say, God, would you burn your way into my heart that I would know how to walk forward? God called him, but at this time, Moses was right where most of us are. He was probably a little discouraged. Verse 11 of chapter 3, Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to God? You notice the confidence is gone. Back in the first part we read, he had confidence. He jumped right up. He picked up whatever he needed, a billy club or whatever, and he killed the guy. He had confidence to beat beat the band. He He was not hurting. But now he's lacking confidence. He says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Israel? He said, I'm sorry, God said, verse 12, but I will be with you and this will be the sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Israel and you shall serve the God on this mountain. And then Moses said to God, if I come to the children, or I'm sorry, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they will ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the God of Jacob has sent you. And this is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Now go and gather the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord. And so God is talking to Moses on and on. Every time God lays it out, Moses pushes back. He says, Lord, oh God, but I don't. And he's arguing with the Almighty. Moses is arguing with God. Have you ever done that? Moses is arguing with God, and God is so gracious. He's so kind. He's so gracious. I'm going to skip some of this dialogue here. You can go look at it and read it later. But I'm going to jump into uh, chapter 4. Chapter 4 of Exodus. Then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. And the Lord said to him, what is in your hand? You see that? What is in your hand? God looked at Moses, said, what is in your hand? He said, a staff. That's all he said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground and it turned into a serpent. How do you like that? 
He threw his staff on the ground, looked similar to a cane perhaps, this tall, straight stick. He'd use it to, you know, do his shepherding with his sheep and whatever. But he threw it on the ground and the thing became a, sm- uh, you know, became a snake. And Moses did exactly what I would do. He ran from it. I don't like snakes. If we're close together, somebody has got to go immediately. I don't do snakes. Moses was afraid and he ran from it. But the Lord said to him, put your hand out and catch it by the tail. So he put his hand out and he caught it and it became a staff again in his hand. I'd like to point something out to you. What is in your hand? And oftentimes when God touches what is in our hands, it scares us. What do you do? Do you drive a truck? Have you asked God to touch it? Because God wants you more there than just driving a truck and taking that load to the next place. God showed this to me back in 2003, 2004. I was driving a feed truck, delivering feed to the farmers. And one day it dawned on me, a revelation. I am not just a feed truck driver. I'm hauling feed for Jesus. Amen. I am not, like, this is not my primary. Hauling the feed, feeding the cows is not my primary. My primary is making contacts with people. I'm driving a feed truck because I'm going out to the farms and I'm making contacts. I'm I'm having great conversations by this. You see, driving the feed truck was only the thing that God had chosen for me to be in, but growth and, you know, growing spiritually is what God had in mind. What is in your hand What would you think if God touched it? You see, well, I'll talk about that later. So, he grabbed the snake by the tail and it again became a staff. Verse 5, that they may know, I'm sorry, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Again, the Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. So he put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, like snow. Now that'll freak you out. Then God said, put your hand back inside. So he put his hand back inside, and it was gone. And his flesh was restored. Verse 8, if they still will not believe you, God said, or listen to the first sign that you may that they may believe the latter sign, if they will not believe even these two signs or listen to your voice, you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it onto the dry ground and the water that you shall take from the Nile will become blood on the, di- uh, on the dry ground. So God has spent how much time trying to convince one of his creatures that he wants to use him? And he's arguing and arguing. Ar- Parents, you, you know what this is like, right? You've had this with your 10-year-old right? I mean conversation. That just goes on and on and on. And finally, you get to the point where we're like, okay, I am losing a whole lot of patience right now. Huh? You know, you know what I'm talking about. But Moses again said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to me, but I am slow of speech. All of a sudden, now it's not about them not believing him. Now it's about him. Oh, but God, I can't do it. Lord, I don't talk well. You know, whatever. He he goes on. And I am slow of speech and tongue. Then the Lord just said to him, who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and will teach you what you shall speak. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Verse 14, then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. I dare to say that any one of us put in God's position would have not had grace for that long. But Almighty God was so gracious and so kind. And he just kept working and kept working and kept working with Moses. Moses keeps arguing, and all of a sudden, he says that God's anger is kindled against him. And I would like to, I would like to point something out here <clears throat> that I want to talk about. So I think there is a natural gift and there's a supernatural gift that God has given us. Moses' natural gift was his staff. 
He could be a shepherd even if he wasn't a Christian. Well, Christian back then, even if he hadn't been following God. He could be a shepherd. But there was something wrong with his mouth. I believe it's possible that he stuttered. I think it's possible that he stuttered. He could see his way through eventually. He could see his way through using the staff. But when God touched on something that would take a supernatural power to fix, Moses is done. He says, no way, no way. I will not do it. God calls on Aaron, his brother. I'd like to submit to you that Aaron was the backup plan. Moses, think about this. What kind of blessing did Moses miss out on by not surrendering his mouth to God the way he did his staff? You see, when I was, when I was a youngster, I grew up in a singing family, and I played guitar and sang long before I became a Christian. When I became a Christian, I thought I was going to have to give up music. When somebody shared the gospel with me, I thought, I actually came to this point in June of 2008. Yeah, 2002, sorry. Two, yeah, 2002. June of 2002, I came to the point, I said this, I want to become a Christian, but not before I play another concert or two at the parties where we were playing because I want to do that as my last blast, you know, before I give my heart. And what was insinuated by that is God was going to take this away. That was my plan, but it didn't happen. I got saved in August of 2002, and God didn't take it away. He touched it. He touched it. I still play it. I still play in front of people. But it's because of the new one now. It's not because of the old. God touched it. This was my natural gift. My supernatural gift that God wanted to call me to was preaching. I was the young Amish kid who stood in the back of the church and mocked the Amish preachers. I mocked them. I can do them line for line. I could do the head movements and the hand movements. I mocked Mennonite preachers, I mocked preachers. I would stand in a room and preach, make, make fun of them. What do you think happened when God called me to preach? I said, no way, absolutely no way. You see, singing and playing guitar was a natural gift. Preaching was a supernatural thing that God had to do on the inside because I could never do it on my own, never. But now, I would rather preach than sing, but I enjoy both. What is in your hands? What is in your hand, rather? I want you to, for me, it's flipping the page. I don't know where you're at. But verse 19, actually, uh, I'm going to, yeah, verse 17 of Exodus chapter 4, read, um, I want to start reading in verse 17. God is speaking to Moses after he has agreed to let Aaron to be, you know, you know, to be a sidekick. And take in your hand this staff with you in which you shall do the signs. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt. By the way, he was seeking his father-in-law's blessing. Do you see that? I love that whole principle of blessing too. And he was seeking his father-in-law's blessing. He says, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see where they are, to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses, I'm so sorry, I am getting mixed up here. Verse 19, and the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife, his sons, And had them ride on a donkey, and he went back to the land of Egypt, listen closely, and Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Somewhere in the story, the staff turned into the staff of God. Do you see that? What happened in the meantime, people? God touched it. God touched it. So, what is in your hands? What do you do? What are you gifted at? What is your endowment? What is your, what is your strength? Whenever people think of you, what do they think of? Whenever you think of something that you would like to do and you're in your prayer closet, 
What is it that comes out? Does it scare you? Or do you find a sense of rest in it to say, yeah, I want to walk in that? Now I find fulfillment <clears throat> in preaching. And 20 years ago, I never thought it'd be possible. You see, I had an abusive person in my life, that, a couple different levels of abuse, but one of those was verbal abuse and physical. And, I've, and I developed a stuttering issue when I was a very small child. A lot of children have that when they're young, as they're, you know, their mouth is trying to catch up with their brain, they're trying to learn. But I was right in that when I had this very angry person with me that didn't know how to care for a little guy. As I grew up, the stuttering stayed there, and I got made fun of a lot for my stuttering. And so I was able to hide it, and I'm still pretty good at hiding it. But when God called me to preach, what do you think the very first thing is that came to my mind? I am not eloquent in speech. He says, God, please, Lord. You don't, Lord, you don't understand. I, I, I can't. 20 years, and God has been faithful. Have I ever stuttered in preaching? Sure, I have. God gives me grace. And I'm so grateful for that. I don't know if you picked this up, but in the first part of chapter 4, if you want to make a note, you can look at it later. In the first part of chapter 4, because this is another thing that can be, you know, can be back to this. When God told Moses to go, he immediately was concerned about what, the, about what his people would say. I would suggest to you that that fear and that concern was there because of the pain of his past of how he left there. When he was a young man and he killed the Egyptian, the next day he tried to help someone else and they made fun of him. They mocked him and they rejected his save and deliver gift. When that happens, that puts a mark on you. There's a, there's a pain associated with that. I would suggest that in four, in Exodus chapter four, whenever God said it, I would suggest that it's very likely that that conversation is what flashed through Moses' mind. I don't know that for sure, but that's my, that's my thought. What pain of the past, what failure of the past comes to your mind whenever you think of what God might want to do with you? Well, you say, Amos, you know, I can see how God can use, you know, uh, whoever, you know, the Mercy Road team or Jason or Josh or, you know, I, I, I mean, oh yeah, I can easily see that. But me? Are you serious? God can't use me. Yeah. That can only be true if you're willing to accept that God made you and told you to do nothing. Said, okay, now, here, here you are. I created you. I created you in your father's image. I created you in my engine, uh, you know, in my image and after my likeness. But my purpose for you? Nothing. Just work. Work at the trailer factory. Make some dough. Buy a new truck if you can. Okay? But other than that, just kind of hang tight and be chill. Yeah. Seriously? You think that's what God is saying? Absolutely not. He says, I have called you. I have created you. I have placed a burden in your heart. And I want to raise you up. I want to use you. Does that mean, well, I can't be a pastor? Nobody said anything about being a pastor. No, you don't have to be a pastor to serve God. No way. Let's just look at a few. I'm not going to get into, into any of these, but just, just a couple right off the top of my head. David had a slingshot. That's all he had. Slingshot and a whole lot of faith. It wasn't a miracle that he killed the giant. It was faith. He believed in God. And he knew what he was doing. Saul wanted to dress him up, but David said, no, just let me have what's in my hand. Because God has touched it. Paul was steeped in religion, and he had something that nobody thought could ever be used for good. And that was a whole lot of knowledge. Paul was a smart, smart man. God saved him. He didn't change him. 
He said, Paul, I'm going to use what's in your hand. See, we get this idea that God wants to save us and then totally rearrange everything about us. And that may be true. But more times than not, God says, I just want to touch what you're already doing. I want to touch what's in your hand. David had a slingshot. Paul had a lot of knowledge. Rahab had a, had a scarf. God used it. The little boy in Matthew 7 or, or 8, um, one of those two, what did he have? A lunchbox. A lunchbox. Did you hear me right? A lunchbox. He had a lunchbox. And God fed 5,000 plus people with the guy's lunch. All he had to do was surrender it. God touched his lunchbox. The woman at the well had a cup of water. May I submit to you that she was doing her daily chores. She wasn't doing anything special. She was going about her day doing her daily chores, and God met her there and touched it. Simon Peter and some of the disciples were fishermen. What did God say to him? Follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. God touched them. God did a new work in their heart. So, what is in your hand? What is in your hand? What is in your heart? What is the burden? If anything kept you awake at night, what would it be? I'm going to throw these things out for you to think about, then we'll pray. What is your burden? Identify these, by the way. I would encourage you to get into a closet and pray. What is your burden? What is in your hand? And then whenever you discover what's in your hand, take it and give it to Jesus. Take it and give it to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm, I'm not just a mom. I'm not just a truck driver. But I take that and Jesus, I bring it to you and I ask you to touch it. Prepare to accept what God prompts your heart and then await confirmation from those around you because people will see it in you and they will bless you. I don't know this body well, but I know I see a lot of familiar faces and I know there's a lot of faithful people here. This is where we come in, by the way. Am I going past your closing time? Josh, when do you normally close? I can't imagine you want me to preach till 1130. Okay. I know you start a little earlier. But the lunchbox, the, you know, the guy in the lunchbox. Do you know that the little boy in the lunchbox didn't go straight to Jesus? Did you know that? Yeah. You know who saw him? Andrew. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saw the little boy with the lunchbox. He went over to the little boy with the lunchbox, and he saw what he had. Then he went back to Jesus, and he said, Hey, Jesus, um, there's a guy over here with a lunchbox. Can I suggest to you that we need Andrews? We need Andrews, men and women who are mature in the faith, to go to Jesus and say, Jesus, have you noticed so-and-so in our congregation, Lord? God... It seems like you've given them a gift, a lunchbox. Help me to know, God, how I can come around them. And then what would it look like for Andrews to go to these young people, put an arm around their shoulder and say, you know what, has God called you to this? They may be slow to admit to it, but if they do, you can say, hey, you know what, can I walk with you? Can I encourage you? I can really see that in you. God is, you know, if God has put that endowment, that, that spiritual gift on you, I would like to bless you in that. And you'll know the time. Whenever it's time for you to start walking in that, I pray that God will open those doors for you. Does that make sense? We need Andrews. You know what I got? Right when I first got saved, I had so much energy and passion and I saw my gifts. I had two different people. I had Andrews and then I had those other kind. The kind I don't want to be like. The kind that walked up to me and say, yeah, I see. You got a lot of energy and passion. Now, one guy said this to me. He said, here's the thing. When the going gets tough, the tough keep going. He said, you got to know how you pull up your bootstraps. I'm a young guy in the faith. I'm only a couple months old. I'm looking at my, what does that even mean? 
when the tough, when the going gets tough, the tough, tough keeps going? Like, what does that mean? How about we encourage? How about we say, bless you, bless you. I see that in you. We need Andrews. Await confirmation from the body and then allow development time to happen. Only God can give you wisdom to discern the difference, the difference, the difference between development and laziness. Only God can help you know the difference between a period of development and when you're just being flat lazy and you don't want to do what God is calling you to do. Allow God to show you the difference and walk in that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you are good. You are the good God. You're a, you're a giver. You're a blesser. Lord, you tell us in Genesis 129 that after you created us in your image, the very first thing you did was you blessed us. I am so grateful for that. Father, I pray for every heart here, young and old, from children to elderly. Father, I pray that you would help us to see and know and understand, Father, that you have a purpose for us in your kingdom and in this body. Lord, would you bless the word that I shared? Father, would you bless it to every heart, to my own heart, and bring forth fruit, God, by your grace.